Good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Welcome to the show. Today, I have a special guest for a special cause for special people. Her name is Geraldine Baker. She is the director of One Spirit. We're going to talk about what One Spirit is. You can check her work out at nativeprogress.org. There is a live link right here. Click on through. Uh, good morning, Jerry. <laughs> good morning, Maria. <laughs> How are you today? I'm very, very good, thank you. It's uh, it's a bit hot and a bit warm, uh, but other than that, hey, life is good. All right. Well, uh, I, I've introduced you as the director of One Spirit, and even though One Spirit was honored as a 2016 top-rated nonprofit, a lot of people don't right. know and still have not heard of One Spirit. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, One Spirit, I founded the One Spirit organization in 2005, four and five. And the reason was I had been working with a medicine man uh, on the Mattapunai Reservation in Virginia and had um, been told about the, the problems and the poverty on Pine Ridge Reservation. And being a person from the Appalachian Mountains, uh, and with that kind of upbringing, I'm not a person who can let something go uh, who that needs to be rectified. And seeing a, a whole group of people in our country uh, who were living in, in poverty and in need made me want to take action. Uh, what I found was a group of people that were absolutely, I learned more than I could possibly ever give. Um, it was, it's been a wonderful 10, 11 years of getting to know the Lakota people and, uh, what their culture is all about, uh, and, uh, and being able to go out and to be friends with them on their territory. Every time I go out, I learn something new. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's like, oh my goodness, I should have known that before. Right. But, um, but it's, it's been a, a great journey. Right. And, you know, I, I know that you're one of our elders, uh, yes. so, you know, you're really putting in the time. And, you know, as I was recently told, I'm no spring chicken. Uh, where do you find no. the energy to do what you do? I know you just spent 10 days on the reservation. Uh, you know, uh, I just always have had a lot of energy. And, and there's something inside of me, the adrenaline grows and, you know, you've got to, you've got to move. Everybody's always, my friends are always saying to me, why don't you retire? And I'm saying, and do what? <laughs> right, I feel the same uh, way. Or they're saying, well, you know, do something that's fun. I'm saying, but you know, I am having fun. I'm, I'm having a world of fun. I'm enjoying every minute of it. I love getting to know the Lakota people. I have loved that. And I have loved uh, the success that they have had of putting up a youth center, of putting up a safe house for the kids, of having a food program that really feeds their 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 folks right so right. what what else do you want to do in your retirement you exactly know? when my friends tell me why don't you stop doing that show it's making you crazy i'm like what else would i do you know <laughs> what are you gonna do right you, you gonna got... watch tv or something i don't know <laughs> well you know when you get to when you get to the point in your life where you're a matriarch i think it's our duty to give back well it, yeah i think it is too and you know what maria i have found People, the whole world, uh, well, okay, the world over is a bit of an exaggeration, but all over Europe and the United States, uh, many people from Australia, uh, from other various, you know, some people from various other parts of the world uh, who really feel the same way. And they often come to me and say, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to find something that I can do that makes a difference to people in the world. Absolutely. And, and that's what it's all about. That's what people want to do. Uh, given you know, we're not a government agency and we're not a government, and if we can do something together that really makes a difference, then you know we don't have as many constraints as the government does, and we can just go do it. Exactly. That's my new slogan now. See something, do something. <laughs> see something, do something. Right. <laughs> right. Instead of the government, see something, say something. Turn your neighbor in for a hangnail. I say see right. something, do something. You know, I do think... Do something, do something. Right. I like that, Maria. I really like that. I have to use, think about using that. Feel free to use it. I'm trying to make it go viral. See something, do something. When I see the rare right. good news story of somebody helping a neighbor 
or a policeman actually doing something good or somebody saving somebody from drowning. I always post that with the hashtag, see something, do yeah. something. I think people are still waiting for the government to take care of them. And I would assume that the plight of the Lakota tells you very clearly that the government isn't going to do anything. You know, I just tell people no lives matter. You know, and the only way it's going to matter is if we make it matter. Yeah, and I think we have to go with all lives matter. Exactly. You know, all lives. And, exactly. Uh, whether it's a black person or a policeman or an Indian child in a, a hockey game who has beer thrown at them or, you know, exactly. all lives matter. Well, you know, I do notice on social media, you know, when the, the latest shootings or whatever, and the fact that they very rarely report on Native Americans that get shot by police right. or Latinos. Right. Latinos seem to have the same problem, if you want to call it a problem. Uh, but I, well, I, I, I do try to cover that as much as possible because, you know, like you said, all lives matter, and especially lives matter. the lives of the yeah. original people. You know, I think that a lot of Americans don't have any real handle on the real history of how this country, well, I don't even want to call it founded, was stolen. Um, and, right. you know, I mean, he, they came here, they found these super healthy, super wonderful, super spiritual, super, super sharing people and said, you know, let's kill them all and take the land. And I look That's at America right. now and I said, you know, a country founded by genocide could very easily end the same way. Yep, so, you're right. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is, is that we have to look at, if we can get people to do that, is that the Indians, the Native Americans, have so much wisdom and so much to offer to the world. Right. This is true of every, every culture. They all have things to offer. You know, and we are a country that really was founded on that principle, is, which is the most amazing thing. I mean, besides the Native Americans. I don't mean, you know, Going, when we came here, the idea supposedly that was put out was, you know, we are here for freedom, right? Right. And, uh, but we didn't, I mean, obviously that didn't go for the Indians, but, uh, uh, but that was the whole idea was that we're here a, as a place where all people can be free. Um, I'd like to see it be that. <laughs> I would too. I, you know, I keep telling people every law passed is another freedom lost. And when you look yeah. at, you know, we have, I live in Arizona and we have a lot of reservations here. And when I drive mm -hmm. through the reservations, all I can see is desperation, it's poverty, it's, you know, starkness, even though they're sitting on some of the most expensive land in Scottsdale, Arizona, you can see, right. you can see the dichotomy, you know, the super rich, and then you see the reservations which to me, you know, are almost like being in a prison without any bars around it. You know, we do feel that way. And this is the other thing that the Native Americans have to teach us. Uh, and it's the balance, I think, Maria, between what we normally think of as a comfortable life, which demands a certain income, right? Mm -hmm. And what the Native Americans may see, I mean, certainly they don't need to have the hunger that's on their reservation or the fact that they don't have heat in the winter time or those things. But besides that, they also have a way of really enjoying life. You know, the, um, right. uh, when I go out there, in fact, if one of the um, elders said to me, Jerry, why do you, when you come here, all you do is work, right? Why don't you sit down and let's talk about our toenails for a while? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, Okay. Well, yeah, I got that. <laughs> Let's just sit down and just have fun, and we could joke and we could talk. Right. And I think that 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 kind of attitude and what they bring, uh, that and many many other things, makes a huge difference and can make a huge difference to us. Absolutely. Because we are so so work focused. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's the way, unfortunately, this country was set up. I don't agree with it. I just said to one of my yeah. friends yesterday, wouldn't life be so much better if we didn't have to worry about money? Right. Uh, yeah. Speaking about money, you know, you I, I surfed the heck out of your website yesterday. And, oh, good. And some of yeah. it, you know, might be startling for some of my listeners. So I want to just read a little paragraph I got off your site. We're talking okay. about we're talking about Pine Ridge, South Dakota, 
and you say this is the plight of the Lakota people living on reservations there. Now these are startling facts, folks. Life expectancy is 48 years old for men and 52 years old for women. Unemployment is around 87%. 90% of them live below the federal poverty level. Teenage suicide rate is three and a half times higher than the national average. Infant mortality is five times higher than the national average. And diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and malnutrition epidemic. I mean, these are startling figures to believe that anybody in what is touted as the richest country in the world can be living like this in the United States. Uh, Those are the figures that made me say, I can't tolerate this. This is something that needs to be done. Whatever I can do, I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you and I had a previous conversation, and I think everything you're doing is excellent especially uh, one of the projects you have to bring back the buffalo. Okay, now the buffalo, my understanding through my own readings of real history, the buffalo were like the department store, pharmaceutical store, and the food store for Native Americans. Uh, And the clothing, yeah, the the department store. And clothing, okay, forgot that one off. Right, so when the invaders came to this country, you know, it makes sense that if they wanted to cripple the population here, they just decimated the buffalo population. That's correct, yeah. Now, you know, living in Arizona, even though I'm not Native American, uh, I can tell you this. When I first moved out here from New York, one of the first things I did was I learned the mountain ranges here. I learned the shapes of the mountains. I learned the names of the mountains because that helps me get around. Right. And every time I see a familiar mountain or I say hello to it by name, maybe I'm a crazy person, I don't know, but I do, I talk to them, I think about the Native Americans who lived their whole lives in familiar territory, figuring out where they were by the mountains and the trees and the cactus and the plants, and how cruel it was to relocate those people to actually was like taking them out of a safe home and putting them on another planet to disorient yeah. them. Yes. You know, so a and lot of the There thing, was always a, right. a trail of tears and everything else that we all know about. You know, right. I hope we all know about. Well, a lot of people don't, believe it or not. And as I told you yeah. earlier, I think it was like maybe in the mid-1980s one of my girlfriends said to me, I really think that you should read this book. And she handed me a copy of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown. And I have to tell you, within the first three pages, I was crying like a baby. And I think I stayed crying through the whole book. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I would think one of the other authors that have covered it really well was Howard Zinn and his History of America. Uh, but most people, this is not what we were taught in school. You know, we had the romanticized version of the Native Americans, the romanticized version of Thanksgiving. And I found that the more I learned and the longer I lived, the less I could celebrate any of those holidays without feeling yeah. like a hypocrite. Uh, and as an I, Italian, I, it hurt. I think it, the Natives it, call right. it, Maria, the Natives call it uh, Native American Day. Yeah, and uh, and that's what they celebrate. They do not celebrate Thanksgiving. Well, I haven't celebrated Thanksgiving in decades now, because I don't want to yeah. be a part of it. It's and even as an Italian, where one of their greatest uh, one of their greatest prides, pride moments was that Columbus discovered America. But when I really learned about Columbus, even as an Italian, I said, "Yeah, okay, I'm not celebrating that day either." Uh, And I think that if more Americans were better educated, which, of course, you have to be self-educated because schools aren't going to teach you that, things would change. People would care. I think and I think they do when they learn about it. Mm -hmm. Um, How many people tell me almost every day and they usually begin with, well, where is Pine Ridge? You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and and once they know it's in this kind of the country. Uh, they say, are you doing it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, they really don't know about Pine Ridge. And when people find out what's there, they can hardly believe it. And then they go there, right? Mm-hmm. And come back and say, yeah, that's right. Um, but, you know, and again, you know, you can go, it's always, you know, I always want to balance things because 
you can go to Pine Ridge and see the poverty. I mean, you can drive through and see the poverty. Uh, and you can see the people there trying to sell be- their beadwork and-, and their art and that kind of thing. But unless you really go there and get to talk with and be with the people, uh, you don't really know Pine Ridge Reservation. And even now, about 10, 11 years later, uh, do I know the culture completely? Heavens no, I know a lot about it. But, um, but you know, every time I go there, every time I talk to them, I learn something new. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a difficult thing to, to understand from your own, to, I guess, to allow your own cultural uh, biases and ideas to be suspended while you listen to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Right. And to really hear what they have to say. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure it's got to be fascinating, to say the least. You know, I think about, you know, some of the some of the ancient prophecies, you know, especially I I don't remember who because I I haven't read these books in so long, uh, where they talked about a rainbow nation, rainbow people. Right. Uh, Do they still believe that that's doable? Is that achievable? They do, you know, and again, I don't want to, uh, you know, what I'm going to suggest is that if you're interested and if your listeners are interested is that we talk a little bit more about the Lakota culture and what it has to offer by bringing a Lakota person, a traditional Lakota person onto your show uh, and, uh, and talking about what they, what their culture is like and what, so that we can see what they have to offer to the world. Yeah, that sounds great. That's something I would look forward to doing. I did look on your site and I saw the four principles or tenets of the Lakota. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Generosity, courage, respect, and wisdom. And wisdom, that's correct. And I think one of the important things is respect. I've just been having conversations with some of my friends about how rude everybody seems to be lately. Uh, don't respecting, you know, no respect for their elders, you know, uh, no respect for children. But as far as my understanding is, when they talk about respect, they do respect their elders for their wisdom and they respect their young because they're the future. Okay. They're the future of the people. And this is something that is very quickly going away in, in, I, I don't know how else to say it, white man's America. Yeah, uh, yeah. The children are, are sacred to the Lakota people, uh, and and certainly they respect and revere their elders. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no question that they have a whole elder program that is geared to do to nothing than to take care of the elders. Uh, the children are the children are handled in a different way. They go with their uh, their caretakers, whether it be their parents or their grandparents, wherever they go. I mean, you know they are not so much put into daycare or any of this thing. They, they are there. If uh, they, I've been in sweats and, and other ceremonies where the children are there, they're not left out. Uh, and I know that we take our own children to church or something like that. But these, these are not, they're not separated in any way. They're there uh, as part of that environment. Right. So there's a huge respect. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it was also my understanding that <clears throat> they don't even have a word for children uh, in uh, in their language. They call them little people, and they treat them like little people. And they treat them like little people, right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I look at some they of my friends indeed. who are still coddling their 30 and 40-year-old children. <laughs> and, yeah. I'm, and I'm like, at what point do these kids move out? <laughs> you know what I mean? When are they going to be independent and on their own? Uh, yeah. Well, I know that they have a lot of problems there. I have watched their weather there, especially in the winter, which has to be a nightmare. Uh, even if you had a house that had, you know, heat yeah. and a stove and this and that. I, I don't even know how anybody can live with, you know, 40 degrees, you know, 40, minus 40 degrees temperatures. And I don't think that people understand the kind of poverty that's there. And, you know, Americans, for some reason, have that, you know, I got mine, you get yours, you know, I go to work, you can get a job. I don't think people really understand the situation on the ground. 
They don't. And, and you know, this more and more you hear people because that's the kind of thing that we say to people who have the opportunity and the ability to get a job or to get something. But if you have lived on the reservation, it's, it's an intricate, complicated situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, our government put them on the reservation with the assurance that they would be taken care of. In return to their land, they would be taken care of. And there are all kinds of broken all the time. Mm-hmm. Jerry, I think and, I think your phone is getting a little a little a little wobbly. So try to just Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Just try uh, to stay near your phone. Yeah. Uh but I think that you know, they um we we took the land, we, we broke the treaties that we made with the Indians in order to have the land and to stop the fighting and uh then we just we just ignored them. Absolutely ignored them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we now have them on a, on a reservation, and we've reduced the amount of land they have uh, continuously over the years. They um, and down there, the nearest place where they could get a job is, you know, miles, hundreds of miles away. Uh, they don't have the income to to go and do that, and if if they do have the income to travel, if they manage to travel there or to go and live there. The, the bias and the prejudice is enormous uh, toward the people there. And, you know, it's, um, you know, that was, I think, the epitome of that we saw last January, a year ago, when the children had earned uh, through their education the right to go to a hockey game and beer was thrown on them from above, from a, a, a box seat above them, right? Um, that made the news, and maybe some of you saw that news. Right. Uh, but it's typical of, of the kind of bias that they receive when they go somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to live on this reservation. The jobs are mostly tribal jobs. Um, the, uh, um, they are beginning, to, but, but I want to say they are beginning to try now to, to create jobs, to create uh, employment opportunities, every little bit helps. And they try to do it in their own cultural way, mm-hmm. or they are doing it in their own cultural way, whether it be uh, through tourism and trail rides through the Badlands, the most beautiful Badlands, the most beautiful place in the world, I think, sometimes, except for Red Rock Canyon, perhaps, Maria. <laughs> uh, but, uh, they, uh, but by having trail rides, by uh, by having something that, that uh, they can do within them within their own um, reservation for their own people, uh, whether it be building. I mean, the um, most, the saddest, the saddest thing, I think, is because there are so many deaths on the reservation mm. that one of the things that has a good deal of employment is the casket industry. Uh, so they build caskets, right? But right. because the death rate is so high. That's um, terrible. Yeah. But on the plus they, side, I know that you said that, what are there, about 3,000 people there? How many people are in? Uh, 40,000. 40, 40,000. And I know that right. you've been collecting donations and bringing in food every month. Uh, right. But even better is the fact that you've got them to try to bring back the buffalo and learn how to grow their own food. It's really, really super. You know, sometimes I have to attribute my own dentist, you know, our own having to read our way out of your own cultural thinking, right? Mm-hmm. And we do not always, our, give, our way of giving is not good. You know, we, it's, not that, you know, it's not that we want to go back to the days of the welfare queen and say we're going to cut them all off. You know, that's not the way to go either. Mm-hmm. But, if, you know, we have an idea that the way of giving is to bring to the reservation, uh, you know, our clothing drive, uh, our whatever we, we decide. And, most, and I have to say most often it's secondhand. Uh, some of it is very good. A lot of it is not, is not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, you know, I have seen several times over trucks, semi-trucks that come up and dump clothing and broken toys and broken down couches on the reservation as a gift. Uh, right. And and you watch this thing and go, what is this all about? You know? 
Right. Uh, people there, now you invite people to come out and they're picking over these clothing. Like, you know, I don't even want to say it. It's it, it just, they're, they're climbing through the clothing and this is old, used clothing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no distribution center. There's no place where you can take these because the reservation is very large, right? right. Uh, so there's no place you can take them and, and you know, in good condition and say, here, you know, take these and get them away. Now, some churches will do that, uh, but but as a central location, there's not. Um, but we have a bad way of giving. And my thought was has always been, if you can, and, and often we'll have groups of people who come and want to do something, and that's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Uh, but there's 80% unemployment on the reservation. You know, you know, if you let that sink in for a minute, why do we have people coming to do something when we have 80% unemployment? Right. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. These people are not handicapped. You know, they're not, uh, they have skills. They have a lot of skills. Uh, they're very intelligent. So why are we doing this? I don't understand. So if we had the money to bring a group of people here to help, why don't we give that, uh, have that way for that money to be handled so that they can be employed? Mm. They can earn money for their families. They can do something, right? right. And then when they do something or they, they cut down the wood for the winter or they build a, 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 they repair houses or whatever it is that they do, then we can come and celebrate with them and we can really celebrate. Maybe that's the kind of Thanksgiving we should have, huh? Absolutely. Um, I'd be all for that one, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but please don't, you know, that it's degrading. It's really degrading. Right. Uh, to say, oh, I can do this and you can't, you know? Mm -hmm. That's not true. Right. Right. Uh, so we have done, bring back, let me just go to the food program. And I will be the first to admit that, you know, in my way of thinking, because I was in human services all my life, you know, the way to do was to hand out food, right? Which if somebody's hungry, that's what you do. And that's what we're still doing is making sure nobody goes hungry right? as much as we can. But you can't do this forever, and that's not fair to do it. So you find ways for them and help with them to find within their traditions ways of feeding their own people and sustaining their own and making contributions to the world. So they have buffalo. Let's bring back the buffalo. Right. Uh, let's increase the herd. Let's, instead of, whenever they harvest a buffalo, they harvest it in a ceremonial way that's very beautiful. I'm, I'm not a person who can even eat meat most of the time, but, you know, right. they, they do harvest it in a very beautiful way, a very ceremonial way. The gates, the gates are open to the, to the beyond, and they, um, they pray for the buffalo. They go through this. Uh, and then the buffalo is taken to Nebraska to be processed. Huh. Now, that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Why are we not processing it on the reservation? These people know how to process buffalo. They need the facility to do that. Right. right. So that the buffalo is processed, it's handed out. Now, not only that, but they have the only pure buffalo meat, pure buffalo, that is not hybrid, has no, uh, no cross-pollination, if you will, whatever you're going to call it. With, Right. Uh, beef, it's not beefalo. It's not any part beefalo. Yeah, you know, it's buffalo, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be they they talk about having a way of marketing their buffalo meat, their brand of buffalo meat, off the reservation. Well, you start where you are. First of all, you feed your people, right? Right. And you feed them with the kind of food that they have traditionally had back in the nineteen early early years. They did not have these diseases. They were, they were unknown among the Lakota people. Right. And it's only been, you know, in later years that all of this has happened. Certainly, I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I know how much of it is related to diet, but we do know that a lot of it is related to diet. Right. right. And that the buffalo means more to them. It's, it's certainly about the health uh, of their diet but it's about the emotional and spiritual health of their people as well. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so if we bring back the buffalo, we're doing a world of good for these folks, and they're doing a world of good for themselves. 
Absolutely. Right? They will have to have the buffalo, and that's what this is. So we have started the um, meat processing facility. We've started increasing the herd of buffalo. Uh, uh, just to tell you a really funny thing. So this, while I was on the reservation last week, uh, the it was rut, it was uh, see the season for rut, the rut season for the buffalo, right? So the buffalo male buffaloes started into a rut, and they broke down miles of fences, right? Mm-hmm. Not miles, but I'm sorry, maybe a mile of fences. Right. Uh, and so the parks department buffalo got mixed up with a herd that one spirit has been increasing, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> And they they were all out trying to separate these buffalo out. And finally, the park said, I tell you what, you just take whatever's left and uh, and go ahead and add it to the herd, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, Bam Brewer, who manages the food program and who manages that buffalo herd, uh, called me up. And he said, guess what? We got we suddenly got about 10 more buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. And we thing. had before this started this morning. Well. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway. That's a good thing. Gradually. Let's, right. Yeah, it's a good thing. I mean, like you, so you know, I'm, not, I'm no longer a meat eater. But when I first moved to Arizona, you know, seasonally, they would have buffalo available in right. supermarkets. And everything that I had read about buffalo meat, made it pretty much the leanest, healthiest red meat you could possibly eat, uh, right. especially compared to the filthy, you know, genetically altered cows that everybody's eating now. Uh, and right. I did, you know, I did cook it a few times and it was quite delicious. It was very sweet and very, very delicious. Uh, it is very delicious. Yeah. But, you know, I've been, a, I've been a vegetarian now for almost 20 years, so those days are pretty much behind me. Uh, Jerry, we need to go to a short break. When we get back, let's talk some more about some of the other good stuff going on on the reservation. And stay with us. Jerry and I will be right back.